Uh, no, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, one of the things that when he said about, thanks for saying that, about fiscally conservative with the city, and I think Mark can remember this because it was about the same time that we started doing this, and I don't, either he had come on board right when we just created a reserve fund for the city or, or since that was when the fight was going on. And I say it that way because when I proposed that idea as the treasurer, the mayor at the time was very, very resistant to that. Um, but the alderman went along with that, and we built that up um, to the point of over, well over $5 million by the time I left in 2004, not because of anything I personally did, but the council committed to funding that on a regular basis when they could. And we were fortunate enough that we could fund it. Um, so then when fast forward, and I know Joe and, and Lori and, and anybody else related to city government, Allen, uh, things got tough for the last six, seven years. Um, I honestly believe in talking to the mm -hmm. alt officials that if that fund hadn't been there, uh, and I did have the auditors, they had my back on that, um, and as I tried to convince people. So if they didn't have that, that would have been catastrophic for them based on the fact that they were used, used to all that uh, revenue from gaming and being able to use it for discretionary purposes. So um, I, I am following those footsteps. It is a challenge at the state of Illinois. Um, and Mark can identify with this too, and probably <clears throat> the people in the village of East Dalton and any other villages. One of the things I know, I quietly, behind the scenes, didn't make a big fuss over at the city was, we saw what was happening to the police and fire pension boards to their um, ratio of funding when cities opted not to make the full payment as the actuaries would say. And they didn't do it, cities don't do that just to, because they don't want to. Um, they're faced with fiscal, fiscal situations too. But one of the things we saw going on in, in then was what's gonna happen to city police and fire funds uh, down the road, and I think we're down the road right now in many instances. Um, but I, when I came into the state of Illinois, I saw them doing the same thing. And there was many of us behind the scenes that asked to please, please start making your pension payments uh, because there's going to be a time that this is all going to come to roost, and it has come to roost. So I guess I mentioned that as a precursor to the state of Illinois and what we're faced with. Um, as we move forward through this election cycle, and we enter into the 99th General Assembly in January, the predominant piece of information and legislation that we're going to have to deal with is our pension systems once again. I did not vote for the pension law that was just ruled on, well, the, uh, the one retiree's uh, health benefits was declared unconstitutional but it's fully expected that the entire pension law that was passed is gonna be ruled unconstitutional because it passed by such a majority, or it was overruled um, by such a majority in the Supreme Court. We're gonna to have to address the pension issue once again. And I still feel the same as I did before. If we're gonna pass meaningful pension reforms, it's gonna to have to have the stakeholders involved, and not just the leaders of the House and the Senate, along with a few select members of the House and Senate involved in crafting that legislation. You're going to have to have every member of, not every member, but every representative of every stakeholder involved in those uh, discussions and craft legislation moving forward for that to be ruled constitutional, number one, and to have the backing of the majority of the members of the House and the Senate. Uh, but that's going to be the predominant issue that more than likely you will read about as we move forward starting, not, starting the 99th General Assembly, and that's the pension. That drives everything. It drives the budget. Uh, and that's the lifeblood of the state. It's the lifeblood of the city government. So um, that's the, the issue you're going to hear most about. But before that, we're going through election cycles, obviously. Uh, we're going to be entering into a season. Yeah, well, we've actually started we've entered into it because the ads are starting to, to go, appear now on radio and TV. And we're going to have one of the most hotly contested governor's races in the country. It's going to be one of, it's going to be the most expensive governor's race that was ever, has ever taken place in the state of Illinois. Not so much because we have a, a candidate on the Republican side who is able to fund his own campaign, 
uh, it is doing so, but even absent that, I think we would because of just the, the tremendous amount of money that flows into politics with the Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court a few years ago. And I saw that in my last cycle two years ago. Uh, the money that comes from the super PACs <coughs> is just enormous and it comes out of nowhere. Um, I was in my race two years ago, I was the only race in the state of Illinois where a super PAC and you know, I forget who the head of the super PAC was. It's one of the, uh, Ken Griffin or one of those guys, and don't hold me to that, but it was one of the major ones. They, they, they weighed into the Illinois and I was the only race they weighed into. What they do, they gave, uh, they, they spent almost $100,000 in TV ads, mainly, not minor, minor TV ads, but mainly radio and print. I didn't have any way to counter that directly, so we were, had, I had to rely on the state party to help out. I mean, I didn't, they asked, you know, they, they offered to, and that's the only way we could counter that, but um, I hate to say this, but because of the super PACs and what's going on, uh, just in this legislative district two years ago, between the two candidates, it's just shy of $2 million was spent on a general assembly race for a two-year term. Now, I don't know about you, men and women in this up room, but to me, something doesn't seem right about that. For a job that pays $67,000 if you get a committee post, another nine, um, parties are willing to weigh in to that dollar amount. Uh, and I guess what I'm seeing, though, and we're going to see it in the governor's race, like I said, money into politics is just kind of taking away uh, the ability to interact uh, on a personal level with your constituents, to do the ability to um, get your views out without being distorted. Um, it's just, it's smearing the whole art of politics, if you want to call it that, or the process. Uh, and I would like to see that turn around, but I don't think we are unless the Supreme Court decides at a future date that Citizens United was not the right way to go. But um, politics in general, uh, I still think is the local level. <coughs> no matter if you're at the village level, city, county, state. Um, and I'll give you, a, for instance, as we move into what my view of how I want to represent my district. Yesterday, I don't have an opponent in November, and I'm very, very glad of that. Um, for whatever reason, the other side of the aisle did not want to weigh in this time. Um, but, so I don't have an opponent. I'm not really pushed to go ahead uh, and do the things you would normally do, which like two years ago, starting July 1st, I was walking door to door anywhere from five to seven hours a day, seven days a week, which is what I want you, know, you have to do if you're gonna be successful. But yesterday I had a, an issue that I had to go down to Granite City, Illinois, and see a railroad crossing. Um, as chairman of the transportation, I needed to go down to see what the condition of that was. And I thought to myself, I don't have any appointments in the afternoon, it's about 11.30, and I'm in this neighborhood of Granite City where the railroad crossing was. So I just hopped out of my car, and I always keep stuff in my car, um, and I just started knocking on doors. Um, if I saw that people were home, I'd knock on the door. If not, I'd just leave a piece of literature. But just in, within that two-hour period, I was able to make connections with probably almost two dozen people. Nothing special, just say who, who I am. I'm your state representative. Here's my contact information. If you have any issues, I'd like to you know, be able to try to help you. Um, and to be honest with you, no one had any issues that they wanted to take up. Nobody had any gripes or, or phrases or anything like that. But my point is, um, I think if you're going to do a job like this, you need to be doing that as much as possible, going up to the rotaries as much as possible. I've been invited to Monday night to the Alton Rotary. Um, just those are the type of things that I think, as a representative, you need to do to kind of keep in contact with, the, with your constituents. And that's the way I've tried to conduct myself. Um, just kind of one-on-one, -on -one, uh, let people know that I'm there. I can help if I can. If I can't, I won't lead people down the primrose path. But. Um, that's just the type of representative I want to be, and I've tried to do that for 10 years now. Um, I know probably in varying levels of, of, of good and bad, but uh, that's just the way I kind of want to be as your state representative. 
Um, just a couple points along that line. And this is what gives me the most pleasure um, about being a representative. I had two issues just in the last uh, recent past where people have contacted my office um, and I've been fortunate enough to take the calls. Um, I got a great staff, Tina Williams and Pat Jennings, who do obviously the vast majority of the calls because I'm out of the office uh, for, you know, just many times like I have today or I described in Granite City. But I was fortunate enough to take two different calls in the recent past that really gave me a lot of good feeling. One was from an elder gentleman who had a seizure, maybe, you know, in probably about six to nine months previous. He had been cleared by his doctor to drive, and he was the primary uh, uh, person to transport people in his family. Uh, but for whatever reason, the paperwork, and there was a disconnect between the paperwork that his doctor was giving him and the Department Secretary of State's office. He had tried everything himself uh, to the point where he's just <clears throat> at his wit's end. So I was able to try to get involved, and it's kind of it's kind of neat because you start piecing puzzle, the pieces of the puzzle together. We were eventually able to help this gentleman get his license back and be medically cleared because he was. Um, and to this day, you know, he sees me, and he just he'll never forget that. But. You know, it made him feel good, but I, I can't explain to him, and I've tried to, how much it made me feel good, just help him out. But probably the best one I've had, and this could be right off the top of the whole 10 years, was just two days ago. This is Thursday, so it might be three days ago, Monday. I got a call from a young mother. She had a nine-month-old son, Ryan. And if I, I guess if I don't mention the last name, which I won't, I'm not breaking any HIPAA loss by just saying the first name. But anyway, young Ryan was born with some real, real terrible medical conditions to the point where he's, um, he needs around-the-clock care almost, which his mom is able to provide, but she needs to go back to work because the leave she had from her work and everything else is starting to dry up, and she, she has to be able to provide for, for the family. And she is married, and her husband does too, has provides for them, but it's, it's very, very uh, intensive. So anyway, she was having trouble getting a waiver uh, for young Ryan, who's on a trach and some other conditions. And she just, she said, I don't know where else to turn. And she knew my daughter, and my daughter said, well, just try giving dad a call. So she called me, and I was in the car. Actually, it was with Senator Hing. We were coming back from an event. Um, and I, and she, you could tell she was real, real, you know, she was rightfully concerned and just um, almost ready to cry, it seemed like. And I tried to just talk her down a little bit and say, you know, come on, Laura, we're going to work through this. I don't know exactly um, what I'm going to find out for you, but I'm going I'm to work with you. And we did. I called a guy at DHS, explained the situation, uh, made another call, uh, something that, you know, anybody should be able to do. But, we were able to do that. So I get a call from my daughter, yet last night, probably at 5.30, said that Laura just called and said she had got her waiver for young Ryan, and now she can put, start putting her life back together as far as being able to provide for the family and have a sense of relief that Ryan has provided for medically, um, you know, for his, his intensive needs. So those are the kind of things that give me the best bang for the buck I know some members of the General Assembly, they like to um, get up there and pass their um, feel-good pieces of legislation and things like that. And Senator Hayne and I do that. Um, don't get me wrong, that's a very important piece of the puzzle if you're the representative to pass laws that help your district. We did one, um, we've helped, you know, we were slightly involved with Joe's redefense, uh, the redevelopment of the defense area. Uh, helped with the railroad tracks right, right, right down here, uh, who were in such a terrible condition. Um, those type of things. We just there's going to be a law signed by the governor tomorrow um, that increased the boundaries of the port district. Uh, a methamphetamine law that we passed just recently uh, that was a result of South Roxana contacting me. So we do pass legislation, and it does feel good to do that. But I guess the point I'm driving home is the one-on-one -on -one contact, the ability to help individuals 
And if not, just help them if you can. Just try to be with them when they're what they're going through. That's what really kind of makes my day as far as being a state representative. And um, I guess, to be honest with you, um, I really want to stay in the General Assembly. I, as long as I breathe, I'm going to be able to serve two more years uh, as your state representative. But if you see something you don't like, you need to call me. Um, I've always told people, I'm in the book, I'm on Henry Street, I'm in the book there, I'm in my home. Um, I'm willing to listen to anybody and everybody, whether it's the good, I can hear the good and hear the bad, um, but I thoroughly enjoy being your state representative and it's not a responsibility that I take for granted, nor is it one that I take lightly. Uh, as I represent the members of this district in the Metro East or River Bend area because um, it's something I never dreamed I would be doing uh, and I'm very proud to have done it and we've been doing it and I just pledge to you that as I'm in the General Assembly uh, that's the way I'm going to conduct myself moving forward.